I've spent the last 15 years just pursuing various leads to get more information on my parents. And I finally felt in the last couple of years that it was at the point where I'd like to go back and really explore where my relatives had been. These were relatives that I was deprived of ever knowing. I have tremendous thirst to learn more about them so that even though I wasn't able to uh, enjoy their company, that I at least know a great deal about them, that I better appreciate the suffering they went through. When I was eight or nine, I became really aware of it. I had to go to a Jewish school. You could no longer go to the regular public schools and mingle with other children. You were segregated because you were Jewish and you began to have the feeling that there was something wrong with you because you were Jewish. We had an apartment, my mother and I, and I was downstairs on the pavement playing. I was going to ride my bicycle and there were some boys there and there were Hitler youth. They started saying to me, Jude, Schweinhund, Schwein Jude. That had never happened to me before. One of them took my hand and ran the bicycle, my bicycle chain over my hand. And I still have that scar. So then it became physically very real to me. Right? I could not under, I went upstairs and I said to my mother, but I didn't do anything to them. I didn't do it, I didn't bother them. Why did they do that to me? Because I'm Jewish. After that was Kristallnacht. Things were already very, very bad. My parents were married on November 5th, 1938 in Dresden. It was five days before Crystal Night. They knew things were getting worse. My parents and my grandparents on my mother's side had already started plans to get out. This picture shows a typical joyous family group at the time of a wedding, but in a five-day period to see this joyous picture of a family celebrating a wedding and realize that the synagogue that they were married in was burned down five days later. They were the last wedding in that synagogue. The firefighters were prohibited from fighting the fires that were set in the various synagogues so they could be sure and, and burned to the ground. A fireman went to the top of the dome while it was on fire and removed the Star of David. And for the duration of World War II, he stored that hidden Star of David. There's been a great effort over the last 10 years to rebuild a synagogue in Dresden at the exact spot where the former synagogue existed. In about the last year and a half, they opened a new synagogue and a small Jewish community center. The two buildings are separated and nothing was built on the exact location where the synagogue existed. On the front door, prominently displayed as you come in, is that Star of David, which truly brings a connection between the old and the new. The interior is surrounded by a by kind of way of rear, so you can walk around. around. Something really, really special are the kind of curtains you yeah, see beautiful. there. They also remind of the history of the Jews. As a symbol from when, when they left Egypt and they built up a tent, and it was the beginning of freedom. The community here said when they when we have a tent like this, we, we remind of the leaving of Egypt, remind of the new beginning in history and the new beginning here as well. So, um, Entschuldigung, immer jetzt den Bus, nein, nicht den Bus nach, sondern geradeaus fahren. The next one will be Bernhardstraße. They're close to town. See what I told you? Yeah, Ours may be down. We'll see. That'd be 39. That's the house. I'll show you a picture. See, the roof is still where it took a bomb hit. It's a Catholic kindergarten now. Your grandparents were once living here. Yeah? Yes, yes. So oh, yes, this was our house. To, to try, yeah, but I just want to see the tree. We might as well walk in the yard. All they can do is stop us, right? After they left, it was changed to kind of apartments with several I families see. living here. Mm -hmm. There's the harp tree. Tree's still here. See the harp tree there? This tree, my grandfather, Richard Steinhardt. 
had it planted here and had it shaped and pruned like a harp. You can see as it goes around, comes back out. And even through the Dresden fire bombings, it's in good shape. 39 Bernhardtstrasse, uh, that's where everything started because that's where my, my grandparents lived. That is the most important single spot in our family. And though it took a direct hit in the war, it still stands. When I returned, there is a feeling that you're home and this is where it all started. And from there, you can draw the lines out to freedom in some cases and into death in others. Can you believe the bomb hit that close to the tree? Yeah. The, uh, yeah. the fire bombs, it yeah. took off the whole roof, yeah, but yet today the tree prospers. Look at all the blooms yeah. on it. This is my parents' wedding picture after their wedding, and it's taken right here so they at this door. The door. Yeah, you can see the shape of the door, yeah. Look, at the, look at the pipes they put in. It's, 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 they are still the same. They're the original yeah. pipes, but yeah, this me. thing was yeah, built. Believe me, they didn't have <laughs> okay. Built like a German tank. This is where my uh, father grew up. Werner, yeah, and Emmy, and Kurt, yeah, all three, three children. Yeah, our father, our, who we of course knew very well, our aunt who we knew who got out, but our uncle who we never knew. There is a, a feeling of closeness that uh, this is where our family lived, and uh, you can't duplicate this anywhere. You just wonder uh, all the wonderful things that went on here and the, the occasions, the Passovers, everything that a family participates in went, in, went on in this house. This was added, I'm sure, when they made a floor. Let me see the picture again. Yeah, they just made a window. Maybe, uh, that was a window they made a door out of it. Uh, maybe. The arbors are, were here from the day one. It's unreal how little has changed. What's all the commotion outside? No. No. Is this also a kindergarten, right? Krautwald. She was saying that your grandfather sold it to the family Krautwald. Yeah, that's right. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Klinger. Of, ah, yeah, so of Mr. and Mrs. Klinger's daughter, she is living here for the moment. Oh. She, is re she has rented the flat, yeah? but yeah. the owner is the nephew of Mr. Cartwright. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think that I was aware at that time that he was arrested. I know it now because of all the research that was done. But he was arrested on uh, Crystal Night. On Crystal Night, the Germans arrested 30,000 Jewish men and sent them to three different concentration camps. My uncle Kurt was one of those arrested. He was sent to Buchenwald concentration camp. My aunt and her two children and her mother remained in Dresden in the dwelling that was very close to my grandparents' house. Kurt was one of about 9,600 that was sent to Buchenwald. He remained in Buchenwald for about three weeks, and then they released him on the condition that they immediately begin processing to immigrate. So he went to France, leaving his wife, uh, Marion, and his two children here uh, with the idea that he'd then send for them. They were probably in that place for a year and a half to two years, as best we can tell. Slowly, the Germans took away the rights of Jews. They took away their homes or their apartments and gave them to Nazis, and then would move them into what was called Jew houses. In these Jew houses, they would put nine to 10 families, yes. uh, one family per room, and it was kind of a transit spot for them as they took away first their homes and moved them in, yeah. into something like this, forced. In, in one room like that, a Jewish family was forced to live. Yeah, a whole family. A yeah. whole family. Yeah. In November, of 42, over a two-day period, the Nazis picked up all the remaining Jews in Dresden, which was approaching 300, and moved them to a group of barracks that had been named the Helleberg Camp. On this side, there was the erected the last, the huts or the kind of barracks for the last Jews remaining in Dresden in November 42. 293 Jews from Dresden were deported on March 3, 43 to Auschwitz-Birkenau and murdered. That would be our, our aunt uh, Sonia, our, her children, our, our cousins, uh, Gert and Marion, uh, her mother, Jenny Goldsmith, 
If you didn't know where that sign was, or we didn't have you, you'd never know what went on here. History just buried this. This is where all of the people that lived in Helleberg camp worked, slave laborer. And that's where my Aunt Your Sonia aunt, and Gert she, Marion. She went there. Yeah, and her mother. And her Robert mother did. as well. Yeah. And this is where the last, the last 293 Jews in uh, Dresden were moved into Helleberg camp. The adults worked in here as forced laborers, making uh, munitions and gun sightings and uh, fine uh, technical equipment. railway station on one hand to transport military goods but on the other hand also to uh, bring the Jews to Auschwitz directly and among them were the 293 Jews who lived for a few months in the camp of Hellebel. Aunt Sonia and Gert and Marion and Jenny they left from here in cattle cars right? With no water, no, water, no bathroom facilities, no fuel, uh, no food. It's horrible. And really horrible. Uh, they took it was a two-day trip too. Oh, longer. Longer? Not only two days, longer, because they they placed the, the these uh, trains on side tracks whenever they had to uh, transport more important goods. Yeah. yeah. So the people were suffering, and from time to time they stopped, opened the doors throughout the desert. This mark uh, was placed here by a private initiative to remember that the Jewish citizens of Dresden were sent from this station directly to concentration camps. In Crystal Night, there were about 30,000 Jewish men arrested across Germany and sent to Buchenwald and two other concentration camps. Uncle Kirk was arrested and brought here three days later. His prison number was 30224. Those Jewish businessmen did do a great <laughs> job on the road. <laughs> this wasn't their specialty. No, far from it. Our uncle Kurt Steinhardt was arrested on Crystal Night and three days later was sent to Camp Buchenwald where he remained for about three weeks. And this is a very famous photograph of the detainees at a roll call. Thousands of people at attention. They told them that if they paid their way out, they could get out, but they had to immigrate immediately. And those that didn't have any money would remain. So he must have paid some money, or our grandfather did, in order for him to get out. All the barrack, yeah, all the barracks were back there. And this is the inspection ground. Now that's a later photograph, but this is where, where they had all the roll calls. My grandfather was a, a very good man. If it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here. Neither would anybody, any of my family. 
My grandfather was a very successful merchant. Owned the Steinhardt department store, did very well until 1933. And then as they started putting in more and more regulations, his business got worse and worse and they prohibited any non-Jews from buying. They boycotted. And you also could not uh, terminate any of your employees. So you were, sales were getting less and less and you could not reduce your expenses because it was against the law to fire the Aryans who worked for you. Uh, in addition, they had a livery driver who would report at the end of each day to the Nazi party any non-Jews who had purchased from my grandfather and they would have a visit from the Nazis to be told that they would no longer purchase there. So the, the business just uh, went down and down to where I believe in 1939, again, he was forced to sell it at a very, very low price, but it not only was it a forced sale, but the size and magnitude and success of the business was in no relation then to what it had been prior to 1933. Today we talk about sales decline of 10%, double digit, back then 70%. Who could withstand such a loss? Uh, every morning there would be, don't do business with Jews written on their windows. They would and paint would, on there. Yeah, paint on the windows and they would throw tomatoes and eggs at the buildings. So the first thing that he and my dad and his brother Kurt would do each day is clean off the windows and the sidewalk in front. They also had policemen posted at the front door to make sure that no non-Jews were coming in there. So they had them, a policeman to stop them from walking in the front door, and they had the delivery man telling them if any non-Jews bought. So it was very easy to see how the, how the business deteriorated. They had to pay a very high tax to be allowed to leave the country. So right. many Jews who could sell, yeah, which was not that easy, yeah. their uh, business, they had to give the money they got for that to pay for the kind of leaving tax. Uh, so they had nothing at the end. And the other thing is starting in about 1933, all their accounts were blocked. So even if you sold a business or a house, you put it in your bank account and it was blocked from taking it out. We're now headed to Fort Kesseldorfer Strasser, which was a commercial property my grandfather owned, Richard. In the bottom were several little retail stores. And according to my cousin Margot, she lived with her mother and father in the apartment. Two to six. Two to six, yeah. The, the whole complex. Yeah. So this, this is, is two to two six. And this is the side where four ones was. Yeah, this is right where it was. Two to six. After my parents had immigrated to the U.S. and my uncle had left to go to Paris, that my grandparents remained with my aunt, her two children, and her mother till about early 1940. And that's when they made their decision to go to Berlin and move into a Jewish home for the elderly. There was probably some feel of hope because uh, they could have go gotten out and gone to Panama. They, had, they could not secure a visa to any other country, but they got a visa to Panama they were concerned at their age about the heat and selected the alternative of putting up 50,000 Reich marks at a Jewish home in Berlin that would take care of them for the rest of their lives. Obviously, it ended up that it uh, did not work out as they had anticipated. 65 years later, the Steinharts are back. Yeah, <laughs> the Steinharts are back. Are any of the people Jewish in the neighborhood that, they're, that know they're just uh, you? No, no, no non-Jewish okay. people. Okay. So this was all a garden out here where the residents could go and sit and walk around and all. They thought it was just a, an interim place to be until things got back to normal. But it was, as it turned out, it was all a planned step towards the final solution. Uh, and two sets of stairs. Lots of walking. You know, our grandfather had gout. He did? Yeah, so imagine your joints trying to get up stairwells. Yeah, they left here on either August 11th or August 16th of 1942. And grandfather died 11 months later, July 15th, 43, at the Ressenstadt. They were deported from Berlin on August 24th, 1942, with the 48th age transport. See, the aged people were always together. To Theresienstadt concentration camp, Richard was killed on July 15th, 43. So he, he was there about 11 months. The 
red light through the rail track throughout the entire museum for the rail transports that came here to Theresa. Most came from Prague sure. and Berlin was the second biggest place. Uh, yellow places are showing where the uh, transports arrived from Theresa. So the most were times. This is all the anti-Semitic things that were placed around Czechoslovakia, giving restrictions on Jews, like one hour for shopping and things like that. We're gonna go get our transport numbers. Okay, they reported on August 24th, 42, 48 age transport. There it is. Now that shows, okay, September 1st, 42. Grandmother was deported May 16th, 44. Yes, May 16th. They did arrive to Auschwitz on uh, May 18th because it took place. Uh, yeah, they were two, two days. It said, May, it said May 17th there. They were deported on May 16th. Uh, a transport of 2,447 people. Yeah. All were placed in the family camp for the Jews from the Rosenstadt in the sector 8 to B. It's not 8, it so should B. be B. B, okay. B2. B two B. See on his it said, uh, look at that and see what this says. And did it say he was killed or died? Uh, died on uh, July 15th and uh, in the registers of the Museum of Outreach there is no uh, evidence. This is room of prayer. Rediscovered some six years ago. Oh, just rediscovered yeah. six years ago? Because it was used as a storeroom after mm -hmm. the war. It is a very unique room. It is not known uh, Another similar place in the former ghettos or concentration camps. The reason uh, is that the craftsmen lived here in this uh, house and they were skilled enough to paint the ceilings and the walls. So this was just a hidden synagogue or per, per hall that, yeah. that the uh, yeah. ghetto people used and, and just discovered six years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so, like a hidden treasure. Great, now that you know how uh, religious our grandparents were, they were probably in here a lot of times. I hope so. We knew the day they left Berlin, but we didn't know the day they arrived from Berlin to Therese and that they were on a train. And then they had to walk the two miles from the transport. Oh, it was amazing yeah. they made that. He was 69 and our grandmother was 67. Mm. And he had gout. He wasn't in any condition to make the walk. So this is this gate, this is the entrance to the former central mortuary of, of the ghetto. And those two rooms served as uh, the so-called ceremonial rooms for uh, burials because it was allowed, allowed to pray and to say farewell to, uh, to the relatives or friends. So they were able friends, to have something like a funeral? But not, uh, not individual, but 30 till 60 coffins was, were stored in the room. Some said the prayer, and it, it was uh, it was the end of the ceremony. But they didn't have coffins. Yes, but the coffins were brought to the crematorium. And the bodies were loaded out from the coffins, and uh, the coffins, coffins was back. used uh, over again and, and again. again. This is where our grandfather, Richard Steinhardt, was cremated. He and thirty thousand others. Yeah. In November 1944, all the ashes 
We were, stayed here. Uh, dumped in the, into the river. In the river. People who lived here uh, told me that years after the war, it was possible to see the, the hills of of ashes in the water. How long did it take them to dump the ashes of 44,000? Uh, about 14 days. 14 days. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine why it was hills. I think if we didn't know what had happened, it'd be a lot harder. But I think we know what had happened, and this is just to get closure on seeing it, having a better feel of what they went through and what happened, and know a little more details than we knew uh, before. My Uncle Kurt was forced to immigrate right after his release from Buchenwald while his family remained and ended up incarcerated at the Helleberg camp before being sent to Auschwitz. Uncle Kurt was there when we left. And in fact, he wrote me a poem, which I no longer have, but I know the lines of it. And the last line of it, he's, I guess he had some English. And I give her now a heartly kiss Das glücklichste Maiden auf Erden, which means the luckiest girl on earth, because we were leaving. And he left later, he went to France. We know of four dresses he lived at, but all we, we really know is he did fight in the French resistance and until he was arrested. He was here from 39 to 42, so he was probably here three years in four different locations that we know of. Wow. One of the apartments he stayed at, number 82. This is what I, su yeah. uh, I suspected. The building is not the same. Huh? Yeah. It was, all this was torn down. Oh, they've destroyed the house and uh, made yeah. an apartment. There's the new place. You look at these other houses, you can have a feeling of what it was. What street is this again? Sivry, C-I-V-R-Y. Okay. In 1939, Kurt went to Paris to fight the French resistance because he had been required as a condition of release from Buchenwald. He was required to register as a Jew by the Vichy government in France. Arrested by the French police on March 28, 1942. Committed to Camp Drancy. So he spent uh, about 30 days in uh, Drancy, followed by 40 days in Campine. These are the actual buildings which were the Drancy camp. Under this pathway, at a depth of about one and a half meters, was the tunnel of evasion of a camp of Drancy. It was 36 meters long. It was discovered by the Nazis in November of 43, and it was never completed. There were only three meters missing to reach liberty. Auschwitz-Birkenau is probably the most famous concentration camp. More killing occurred there than anywhere. It's where at three different times, five of my relatives, six including my aunt's mother, ended up and all died. The first one to die there was my Uncle Kurt, who came from Paris, worked about three and a half weeks before he died in 1942. In 1943, my Aunt Sonia, her two children and her mother arrived and were sent to the gas chambers immediately. And in 1944, my grandmother arrived from Theresienstadt. At almost 70 years of age, we can assume that at the selection place, she was sent directly to the gas chambers. We can track how those relatives all ended up there. So it has a, a greater significance in our family's history as the end point of the story for, for practically all of them.
This is uh, B2B, which was an area reserved for the Therese and Stamp family camp. And uh, the deportees from that camp, if they were selected to, to continue living, were placed here. And according to the records, our grandmother, who came in May 1944, was initially put here. There's no record of when she died, and I would imagine at 70 years of age, she didn't last very long. I've learned a great deal from the project. I learned about family members I never had the privilege of knowing. I learned about what they endured. You know, I think the most emotional for me was when it was over. And I said to myself, you did it. You did it. And the thought that my parents and grandparents would know that I'd do that was very fulfilling to me. And I felt that I had accomplished something that I had set out to do. So there was, though it was emotional, it was a great feeling of satisfaction that I had done something that 10, 15 years before would I I never would have thought possible. I've learned the importance of speaking up. How can human beings let a tragedy of this magnitude occur? And so you can see what happens when tyrants are in power. But you can also see that humanity should never sit back and let something this, like this occur without giving of every breath in their body in defiance. People have to vote. People have to learn to care. Not to just listen to newscasts, but to read the newspapers, the editorials. Think about what's going on. As far as my children go, I want them to be so aware of what happened to our family that we can never afford to slip into anything like that again. I don't want us over here to be complacent not be smart enough to learn the lesson. We need to look back and think and learn it, and yes, it can happen here.